Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining DMI's web conversation on the topic of design for people, specifically personas, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Joining us to share his deep insight on this topic is experienced design expert Jonathan Podolsky, Director of Experience Strategy at MADPOW. My name is Pamela DeCesar. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the DMI and I'm delighted to host today's session. Jonathan promises to talk about the experience strategy process and share a guide to the creation and use of personas so you can leverage these composite archetypes to successfully guide design and decision making processes. Before we begin talking design, I'd like you to know our conversation will fill this hour and it's easy to join us by typing your questions into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We will do our best to address them through the hour and we look forward to them. If, and if you should miss anything, this webinar is being recorded and will be available later this week at dmi.org. I'd like to quickly highlight some DMI news. The DMI Leadership Conference will kick off on September 27th in Cambridge, Massachusetts with an innovation tour followed by a cruise on the Charles River in Boston. Following the first full day of the conference on September 28th, we will celebrate our 40th anniversary with a gala where we will honor our founder, Design Luminaries, and announce the winners of our first annual Design Value Awards. But there is more. Because DMI is committed to education in undergraduate, graduate, and post-professional levels, we want to help more students participate in our conferences. So, with the generous support of Oracle and 3M, we're giving 10 students or early career professionals full passes to the conference and a ticket to the anniversary gala. Students and young professionals can find more information at dmi.org slash dlc15. The deadline to apply for one of these 10 spots is August 31st, so it's coming up. Please check out dmi.org slash dlc15 for info on the conference and the gala and the student competition. And now on to our web conversation with Jonathan Podolsky. Jonathan holds a Master's in Architecture from Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. When he's not tinkering in the garage on things like his home-built electric motorcycle or pneumatic ski press, he leads the experience strategy and service design department at the award-winning design agency, MADPOW. Jonathan has an extensive background in creating innovative customer, guest, and patient experiences for major retailers, hospitality companies, and healthcare providers. He leverages more than a decade's worth of industry knowledge in his work reinventing and revolutionizing consumer experiences and services based on brand values and strategic goals and deep customer understanding. Jonathan is an occasional contributor to Service Design Magazine and has taught intro to service design classes at Tufts University. So welcome Jonathan. It sounds like to me like you've taken your architecture, education, and knowledge about built form and design for people within structures to design for people in virtual structures. Is that safe to say? And what would you say are the most striking differences or challenges? So again, welcome, and we can begin. And with that thought, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's, it's great to be here to discuss this important topic. Um, I think throughout my entire career, I've kind of been obsessed with the definition of, of experiences with uh, this ability to, uh, to tell stories or to advocate for individuals and really to um, understand at, at a very kind of humanistic and emotional level what, what people are, really want or what their expectations are within any kind of context uh, 
of, of an experience. Um, arch architecture does that, and um, I kind of fell in love with architecture at first uh, when it comes to the uh, definition of, of the physical nature of an experience, what, what happens around an individual, what's the, the, the objects that surround them. Uh, but soon after I went through the entire process of becoming a, 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 an architect, I began to realize that uh, I, I was that much more obsessed with the actions that take place within the space. Uh, what are the experiences that, take, that, that happen uh, within architecture, but not so much the architecture itself? Um, how do people communicate with each other, uh, with technology, with, with objects? Uh, what are those interfaces and touch points? And what, are the, what is that overall experience potentially like? Um, and so that, that really has led me to my, my, my current position as um, the managing director and, and department lead at Mad Pow for experience strategy and service design. Um, it's a rather interesting position. It's a rather fantastic job where at any one moment I am uh, defining what uh, a customer could be experiencing in, in so many different industries or, uh, or channels or, or just even um, uh, situations they may find themselves in. That could be uh, on, on a Monday looking at how uh, an individual is um, set up for um, rather serious surgery or how in that surgery staff members triage um, unexpected situations. Um, this is really all about facilitating communication and information. Um, and at the same time, those type of methodologies of, of understanding human behavior and, and um, how people kind of interact with each other uh, translates to things like how a consumer shops for an appliance or how an individual um, gets their blood taken or even something as simple as how um, a patron or a guest orders a beer at a restaurant. Um, the, the methodology is kind of universal in that sense. So my, my day job is very, very um, exciting in the sense that um, all these different design experiences live in the world today um, and there are so many others that need help or, or need uh, focus to become more uh, user-centric. And with that in mind, um, I think I'll forever always be employed for this rather fantastic field. Um, some of the reasons as to uh, why experience strategy has, has become so prevalent um, in, in its association with service design is that um, the ways that businesses are interacting with uh, their customers, uh, the methods, the channels, the touch points, um, even the services that they provide seem to be becoming more and more complex uh, before when maybe uh, a simple phone call was all that was needed to uh, initiate a service. Now um, it could be done on a smartphone, it could be done on a tablet, on a computer, it could be um, texted, it could be SMS, it could be video chatted, um, it could still be a phone call, it could be something by mail, um, it could be on a, on a small um, watch-like device now. Th there's so many different ways of interacting with, with customers or patients or, or passengers or purveyors or whoever a business's target user is that it's it's a really hard and, and challenging thing now to to really understand what these uh, all these different variations are. Uh, what are the the um, the holistic or consistent experiences? What should they be? What's that kind of guiding principle, so to speak, of of how to design towards these? Uh, with this in mind, we are and I am approached often with with these type of questions around um, how can I become more customer centric? How can I put my customer as the, as the, the centralized and focused point uh, when it comes to um, uh, a customer-centric model um, so that decisions are made based on the needs of a customer. At the same time, um, consistency or a holistic perspective is also rather important. So that, sorry, I think there's a little bit of an echo. If someone could go on mute, that'd be great. Um, thank you. So, Looking at um, uh, guiding experiences so that um, what we're doing is creating a holistic experiences, knowing that there are so many different channels and methodologies uh, where a customer can achieve the same thing. Um, does it feel like the same company if they cho choose an online or digital platform versus uh, over the phone or something to that extent? Um, so knowing that um, and, and creating those type of consistencies uh, is also rather important when it comes to experience strategy. The, the process itself, for, um, for defining these type of experiences um, is, is not really set in stone. Um, what you see on your screen is, is kind of a, uh, a more of a generic version, so to speak, of really this idea of, of understanding and discovering um, the aspects of, of um, the target user, of, of people. Uh, and and from, from there, 
I like to say that um, experienced strategists really are um, advocates and storytellers. We we advocate for users or for the the people who are uh, the targets of these experiences. Uh, we basically champion their needs, uh, their behaviors, their emotional states, so that when there is a, a change or a design or a new solution, it is reflective of their actual needs. Um, and then how we do that is um, is through storytelling or, or methods that are related to storytelling. Um, I think a very common uh, storytelling method, things that I think a lot of people on this phone would be familiar with, is, is uh, customer journey mapping. This has been a, um, a, a model that's been used rather ex exclusively or um, uh, with, with high praise over the past 10 or 12 years as a, as a tool that can, in a diagrammatical fashion, start to say, look, here's an experience or here's some sort of um, service that, that exists and we can for the first time um, look at that holistically, look at that uh, on paper, so to speak, and then evaluate that. Uh, is this uh, resonating with the customer? Um, are there points of, of distress? Uh, are there other multiple paths as to how an experience could exist? And um, journey maps is, is, is kind of like the go-to format, so to speak, in terms of, of storytelling or, or things of that nature. Now, I actually hire um, storytellers, not so that they can just build journey maps all day, but, but, but to acknowledge that journey mapping is a single tool that, that works with that process, but that there are other methodologies in terms of um, trying to, to convey what an individual is now or could in the future be experiencing through uh, a service or business or a product. Um, through narrative methodologies, um, I hire comic book artists, I hire game designers, individuals that um, are, are experts on different ways of, of conveying and communicating what an experience should be in the future. It's, it's rather exciting in that sense where there isn't really any kind of locked methodology to, to kind of convey the understanding or the saga of the customer, so to speak. Now, um, journey mapping is, is uh, a rather powerful tool or this method of, of experience narrative. Um, just to give you an example, uh, let's talk about my, one, of, one of my favorite topics, which is coffee. I used to drink a lot of coffee. And say, for instance, if a, um, if, if a client who perhaps owns a coffee shop wants to understand what is their existing experience and, and what, we, what we would do to kind of build that analysis or, or build that understanding, um, we could do a, uh, a kind of a, a journey mapping or experience audit type process. And, and for instance here, uh, what if um, we were able to follow a, an, an individual through their experience, uh, a day in the life, so to speak, of, of their coffee uh, purchase experience. And, and with that, we, we know that they would be able to um, you know, find a location, um, a, uh, a physical store, so to speak, uh, walk through that front door, uh, find their way to perhaps a menu uh, communicate with um, staff, uh, a barista. Somehow there's a human-to-human a -human interaction there as well. Um, choose their, their product of choice. That activates something so-called behind the scenes or backstage where um, your delicious cup of joe is being made. And um, there's a final product at the end. Um, there's a delicious latte waiting for you. This is uh, an experience that I think just about every human being, especially if you're in the, in the design world, has gone through once if not many hundreds of times. But um, this is an, an example uh, in, in photos of uh, a simple journey map. What uh, a journey map allows us to do though is to say, um, does this resonate? Is this a successful experience or process? And we do that by asking questions not towards an entire audience, but, but towards individuals. And, and if we did so, um, we can then ask questions like, hey, how was the parking, or uh, why did you pick this one location versus a competitor? Uh, why are you in the mood for this espresso instead of, instead of a latte? Um, did you find the staff friendly? Um, and, and this is that level of not just mapping and defining an experience, but then overlaying the needs of, of, of humans, the, the needs of people, um, and asking them how they feel about an overall process. Um, by, by doing that and by, by being rather individual or talking about people, uh, it allows us to do something that's even more interesting, which is to then say, well, what, what things happened before or after that experience that actually influenced the overall process? And, and we can actually kind of rewind the clock, so to speak, and say, all right, before you even showed up at, the, at, the, at a coffee shop, what else happened? Was, was parking a nightmare? Uh, was it next to impossible to find a, a parking spot or something of that nature? Uh, or maybe 
you had all your kids in, in the, the van with you trying to get coffee and suddenly your relaxing trip to get a cup of joe is, is no longer relaxing because there's 500 kids with you. Uh, or maybe at home you have a really fancy coffee maker. So you have accept, really kind of high expectations as to what that drink should be or, or your taste buds have been burnt out. So you really want that extra dark triple espresso. Um, and the same methodology also works by fast forwarding through experiences by saying, okay, pass the product. When, when the traditional experience is over, what else is happening? Um, did, did you run over and add copious amounts of sugar to your latte, which is a cardinal sin, but maybe you did so because um, the, the product was actually, was actually too bitter. Uh, or maybe you did something really weird, like you ordered your cup of uh, coffee um, to drink in the, uh, in, the, in the restaurant and then pulled out a really strange looking uh, thermos, filled it up and left. Maybe that's like, the, maybe that's like the, your weird nuance that's something that you always do. Um, who knows? The, uh, human beings are, are strange in that nature. There's always the, the weird aspects that happen. And, and, and this ability to, to journey map and to, and to kind of capture these nuances and to understand the experiences of, of, of people is hugely important in terms of being able to define uh, future improvements to any one experience. But the problem is, is that if we do that uh, on, on the individual basis, there could be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different customers. It, it's literally logistically impossible just to run through um, and, and try to test uh, an experience on, on everyone or, or to advocate for everyone's individual needs. It's, it's, it's logistically impossible. So that gets us to personas, which is actually the topic of today's conversation. Um, and, and what a persona really is doing is saying is that, it, is that, yes, you may have a population of individuals, many, many different customers, consumers, or patients, but uh, their behaviors may be easily bucketed into a few specific groups. And by doing that, we could um, create uh, a persona which looks and feels a lot like an actual human being, but in reality is, uh, is a, a composite archetype. It's, it's a grouping of like behaviors that represent larger mass population groups or, or, or groups of behaviors. It, it takes what would be a, a near impossible or mundane process of testing an experience with thousands of people and instead advocating for just a few people. And when you do that, it, A, it saves time, it, it makes it a, a rather uh, feasible process to design towards human needs, but doing so at a higher level. Jonathan, um, yeah. first I want to say that we've been having sound problems, so if I am not muted, no one can hear you. So it's difficult for me to interject with Questions. So I don't know if it's okay for everyone now, but I do have a question, and then we'll go sure. on mute. I'll be muted again until another question um, is there because there's a bad echo. Always something. Anyway, um, someone had written in and asked, what are your thoughts about jobs to be done, JTBD, as alternatives to or in addition to persona. So what are the pros and cons and when might you use personas versus JTBDs and yep. what is your experience with them? And I'm going to be muted again. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a, a great question. The, um, a JTBD is, is a job to be done. It's, it's a different form of modeling. So uh, personas are, are modeling customer bases where uh, a JTBD is actually not so much modeling um, people or individuals, as is at the highest level, it's actually modeling um, high-level value propositions. Uh, the, the, the exa uh, kind of the classic example is that um, if you kept asking a lot of people what they want, and say, for instance, you're a lawn care company, and you, and you repeatedly ask your customers, hey, what are you looking for? Uh, you may get as a response a, um, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a better lawnmower. I'm looking for a better way of cutting my grass. Um, and, and if that's the case, you as that lawn care company could forever be making better versions of a lawnmower because that's the direct correlation in terms of that customer understanding. A JTBD uh, model would say, what is the actual value proposition that this, this person or, or your customers are looking for? And it basically says it's, no one's asking for uh, a better way of cutting grass, they're asking for um, a, a better grass or, or, or that the g general business model or value proposition is um, I don't want my grass to go any, any further above two or three inches, right? That's the actual challenge. It's not better lawnmowers. It's, it's grass that only gr grows for a cer certain height and I don't have to worry about it anymore. 
so when you when you do that, you stop building a better lawnmower and you start looking at other methodologies to to solve for the actual value proposition. In this case, um, genetically modified grass that stops growing at two and a half inches, which incidentally three or four years ago uh, did come out. So so that's what it does is that it uh, it correlates that kind of higher level need. Uh, what uh, and, and that's I think one of the the major positives uh, of that modeling of, of JTBDs. The negatives is that um, it doesn't always directly correlate to the, uh, the, the behavioral and, and emotional states of individuals. For instance, uh, uh, the JTBD may say that um, a genetic, genetically modified grass that only grows two to three inches is a great idea, but it isn't advocating for the individual who then, in, in their context, says, no way in hell would I ever spend $450 for a bag of grass seed um, to, to have grass that does that. In, in reality, that's actually the case. It's, it's, it's a very, very expensive product. Um, so you, you may have an, a success in terms of the innovation. You may have a failure in terms of sales and marketing because um, it still isn't a direct correlation or application um, of, your, of your consumer type. So, um, and I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes how you can kind of layer those two together in a way that makes a lot of sense. In a lot of ways, um, a persona um, is, is almost like a stats sheet, so to speak. And anyone out there who's a, a gamer or a video gamer or have been in the past, when you build that character and, and you have specifics of that character, their ability to jump fast or jump high or run fast or you know, shield defense or attack ratings, those, those are giving you um, uh, kind of insight in terms of the experience that you should be expecting moving forward. You, you know the nuanced traits and behaviors of that character so that uh, you can plan towards those and, and there's an expectation of, of what will come next. And that's what kind of, in a way, personas are doing. They're, um, they're introducing the, the nuances and the behaviors and some of the contextual information of, of, a, of a group of people or maybe even just one person uh, so that you can empathize with that individual and then know some of the potential reactions or outcomes towards design solutions. It, it allows you to think within their perspective so that when you are creating something new, it correlates with their actual need. Now, while all that is... is is good and great, and frankly, I think these are rather powerful tools. The big problem, or the huge challenge, is what I call um, the now what uh, epidemic. And, and frankly, it's, it's over the past few years and months, this this epidemic has actually become more of a pandemic, where um, corporations and companies have invested a lot in in what is needed to build personas. And it's not a simple task of of going out and researching both in qualitative and quantitative ways. Um, to, to get an understanding of consumers and, and customer bases and things of that nature to develop personas. And I think what's happening now is, is that um, with those in mind and, and having these arsenal of, of rich data and, and these personas in hand is uh, what to do next with them. And uh, we, we hear this all the time is, is either to correct existing personas or, or even just to train companies as to what to do with them moving forward, um, and, and for me this is actually rather quite scary, is that these are fantastic tools. Mind you, they're not the only tools that a strategist can use, but they are quite powerful ones, and um, one of the reasons why I, I give this talk is, is to advocate don't give up on personas. Don't give up on this methodology. Um, they are valuable. It may be just in, in the methods of how they were built or how they're being used where there's failure, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next few minutes. Things I hear all the time um, is thanks for the wall art or for the love of God, um, I can't just put this giant poster on my wall and pretend like it's actually going to do something. Um, whether this is a, an, an issue with expectation or, um, or really maybe fundamentally a failure as to how the personas were built. Um, but so often now I find companies that say, yeah, we've done that before. I don't want to build personas again. You know, bad taste in their mouth, so to speak. Um, and, and, it, and there's some growing negativity towards this method methodology because of it. So I'm here to say that um, that negativity is probably correlated or referenced based on um, either some bad consultancy out there, uh, bad end deliverables, or, or really just like a lack of training as to what to do next once there is uh, a persona that's, that's being built. So with that in mind, let's talk about some, some best case practices. What are some really great ways to, um, to develop or build personas um, that have kind of tried and true methods that, that really do yield uh, a useful end product as opposed to something that is sitting on a wall or a placemat. So with that in mind, let's, let's talk about some of the, the core factors that make a good persona. Now, number one is behavior over demographics. This is a 
this is a mistake I see all the time where uh, a, a company will um, leverage things like marketing data or or kind of traditional analytics to try to develop personas and and um, what we'll see is that uh, personas will be segmented on things like um, age or income um, or uh, location, you know, classic demographic data that may be quite valuable for marketing um, or, or, or things of that nature around sales, but um, for a persona that's supposed to advocate for design or for change um, or, or for empathy towards a new solution is not the way to go. Fundamentally, uh, a persona or multiple personas are there to represent variations of behavior that will somehow have end um, result effects to how they interact with the service or product um, or something in between. And so that's, that's what we actually want to capture. It is behaviors uh, of, that, of that persona, not their demographics. If we get into conversations around things like uh, winks or, or dinks or dinkwads, which is a dual income, no kids, with a dog, uh, that type of that type of data, if it doesn't have any kind of direct relation to the product or services, if anything, clouding the information that is important in a persona, or forcing personas to to divide by demographics instead of divide by behavior types. And by a behavior, it could be something as simple as people who are very inclined to use um, apps or or a mobile device, and those who are still very traditionalists in terms of wanting to pick up a phone instead, right? That, that's a behavior. That's not so much a, uh, a specific demographic, although it could potentially correlate to demographics, but it's, it's that behavior that we really care about if that does directly affect how we communicate or resonate our product or service with the customer. That in mind, um, a, another thing that we see often is, is this idea of a one-size-does-not-fit-all model. Uh, or what we usually see is that um, a corporation or a company will have invested time and money to make personas, but not with any one specific design challenge in mind. So they create personas, but they're, they're generic, so to speak, in that they may represent appropriate behaviors or appropriate um, information for reference or, or, or contextual information, but they aren't designed for a, any one solution. They, they aren't uh, all about um, refill management or about signing up for an insurance for the first time or um, you know friends going to the movies and and that's actually rather important because when you add the context of a specific design challenge it does directly affect the behaviors of a persona uh, if we have an individual that's going to the grocery store that that person has certain emotions and behaviors and and priorities you put that exact same person in a situation where they're being prepped for a, for a major surgery, and I can guarantee that their fundamental behaviors will not be the, the same. The, the stressors are, are increased, their uh, impatience is increased, um, their level of, of anxiety are skyrocketed. But if we used one generic persona to solve for both of those situations, uh, we're losing a lot of that kind of nuanced behaviors that are rather important to design for. So with that in mind, uh, we. The, Things that we do to, to adjust to that are, are things like empathy maps, which is to say, um, okay, we, we maybe we have a base persona with kind of base behaviors associated with that. Let's get specific. Let's add context to that persona. Let's introduce them to this specific design challenge or to borrow a UX term, a specific scenario, uh, and do something like an empathy map. And, and when we do this, um, we can start to tease out the nuanced specifics to that one design challenge. Um, the, the question that was mentioned before about the, the JTBD models, uh, jobs to be done, um, the, the dynamics of that fit very nicely into uh, an empathy mapping model. It's, it's doing a lot of the same things in terms of um, fundamental high value challenges and goals being the, the major output. So this is where I think those two models really start to correlate nicely is that when we're creating these empathy maps that are designed specifically to add um, context and nuance uh, understanding to a persona very much is uh, a technique that is modeling um, the JTB, JTBD model. Now, um, with that, as we're, we're building these, these personas and, and trying to add the appropriate amount of contextual information so that we can basically have a, a built empathy towards uh, who an individual is um, and uh, some of their outcomes or, or, or states of being um, some of their triggers, so to speak, on, on, on their behaviors. Uh, one thing to, to, to be aware of and try to avoid is uh, ambiguous details. 
the, the kind of cliche, yet I've seen it many times, example is that, that um, you introduce a persona, they have certain behaviors, um, and one of them, uh, the traits that is added is, hey, maybe this person likes long walks on the beach. And um, as silly as, as that is, I, I've seen this many times where that level of, of added detail is, is thought to be a good thing to put in. Like, hey, this person loves to sail or um, you know, build sand castles on the beach or paints on their in their downtime. The problem is that um, you know personas don't exist just just to exist. They're they're there to to motivate um, decision makers to to allow designers to design towards the perspectives of others instead of themselves. It, it it's there to to evaluate solutions not from our perspective but from the perspective of a of a persona. And if we're doing that, if we're making these evaluations, and, and one of the, the criteria of, of this evaluation is something to do with long walks on the beach, that's a very ambiguous detail. How I translate something like that uh, in terms of the emotional states or wants or needs could be completely different as to how somebody else does it. It, it, it isn't specific. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, an ambiguous emotional uh, reference that is at very high risk of being misinterpreted. And, and, and misinterpreting that type of data is, is catastrophic with personas. Because if that happens, then the whole reason why we built them uh, is, has failed, and that we're actually solving for situations that don't exist or for expectations that aren't really there. With that in mind comes number four in, in, in reference, which is knowing that in, other individuals will be taking these uh, and using these for, for these different methods to, to either design towards or to evaluate solutions towards um, we need to be as, as uh, explicit and specific as possible. Being concise is not a bad thing. If, if, if you can, in two sentences, describe the situation of an individual and a persona as opposed to a, an eight-page uh, long letter about them walking on the beach, that's, so much, that's, a, that's a much better um, uh, methodology and reduces the risk of misinterpretation. It really is kind of a, a game of telephone where if we're all about or advocating for a sense of empathy, but by the time it gets to the person that's actually going to be rolling out a new design and it's been translated somehow over to, I don't know, like cake or something else where, um, where mistranslation has happened, that is a, a fundamental failure of, of, of a persona. This, I think, is, is some of the reasons why um, existing personas aren't used, is that the ability to take what has been, been constructed and then easily translate that towards the next steps of a design or the next steps towards uh, improvement of an experience is sometimes hard to do, and it, and it really has to do with this level of, of additional um, kind of clouding, ambiguous details that, that you could find within these. Another rather important step of, of this overall process of developing a persona has to do with the fact that um, these are qualitative in nature. It's, it's all about trying to understand um, behavior and, and the context around that behavior. And, and to do that is, is fundamentally requiring of not quantitative analysis and research, but, but qualitative in nature. Um, the, the idea is, is really to, to build empathy uh, towards a, a person and, and then design towards that. And you really can't build empathy or, or that level of understanding with uh, quantitative data. Uh, analytics and statistics are great in, in terms of reinforcing that the ideas we have are actually correlating with large populations or groups, but it does not give us those nuanced understanding. To get that, um, there are so many different techniques out there that are of, of more of a qualitative measure of, of research and understanding um, to kind of gain that perspective and then infuse that into personas. Um, what you see on your screen is, is actually a, a long list. Um, personally, my, my absolute favorite, because um, I, I do this all the time every day, is um, passive observations and emulated audience experiences. This is where um, the only really true way of understanding the, the saga or the plight of your customer or your patient is to experience what they're going through. They could try to communicate to you what it was like to um, be prepped for surgery, but if you don't go through it yourself and then uh, really understand all the nuances of that experience, then you probably missed out on so many of the nuanced details. So with this in mind, um, what I have my staff do is, is, is at all possible and all legal ways available to embed themselves in the type of experiences that we're trying to map towards or build personas to. And if that means that we have to um, become OR certified uh, for research and observation so we can stand next to a surgeon during uh, an open heart procedure, then, then so be it. We've done that in the past. Um, and if it means to convince um, you know, the CEOs of certain companies to, to sit on a, 
a gurney in an ambulance and be wheeled through the triage process in an emergency room, we've done that. Um, or if it means that um, uh, we're, we're in a food processing plant to understand how um, um, certain pieces of, 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 um, of meat and produce are, are developed, we've done that as well. Getting as much uh, into the weeds as possible, I think, is hugely important because it's usually not um, the the obvious things that are the big aha moments in terms of, of making improvements or, or finding the next innovative solution. It, it comes from all these little nuanced aspects of of understanding an experience, and those are so hard to gain from just having a conversation with an individual as opposed to actually going through the same type of experiences that they are they themselves have, have gone through. One of the uh, one of the the, the Jonathan, nice takeaways. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, oh, good. But with this muting problem, I'm, I and anyway. Uh, so someone is asking. There's much talk about watching users' behaviors instead of what they report verbally about what yep. they do. And do you think this is too simplistic, especially when you think about talking as action, literally a speech act? So. Um, if you go through the, um, the 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 process of trying to gain understanding of experience, um, and, and if if your only method to do so is to ask um, a customer or a consumer after the fact that, they, that they've done it, you have already guaranteed that you've lost uh, a huge amount of the the nuanced details of, of what the, the experience was like. Because um, for, for a few reasons, one is that uh, we're human beings, and and there are many, many different situations that we find ourselves in, um, in that experiences overlap all the time. And we don't walk into a restaurant and say, ah, from this point forth, everything that happens is all part of this one brand. And, and, and so I will bucket that and store that information so that if a stranger asks me tomorrow, I'll be able to refer to this and, and give uh, exact information as to what this experience was like. That doesn't happen. We don't, we don't, our memory doesn't work that way. We don't catalog uh, experiences and if anything and especially in healthcare where some of these experiences are rather high stress they, they could be terrifying they could be uh, to some people mortifying is, is that by nature you're trying to forget that um, as much as possible you want to not have a memory of what it was like for that pre-op procedure uh, before being wheeled in for um, you know major open heart surgery so to, so to, to ask, ask somebody after the fact what was that that was like it's almost like um, uh, there, there's memory loss, uh, kind of built in in the brain as it is that you know this, this is not something that I want to remember. It was a high stress moment, so it's it's not a very good source of information. And we find that a lot, the, a lot of the work that we do in healthcare um, it revolves around can we trust what we hear versus what we see. So I always recommend that we that it's it's kind of a dual, duality of of, a, of approach where um, talk to individuals, find out what they're saying, get. Uh, references in terms of what they're referring to in terms of emotions and, and things of that nature, but then uh, check their math, so to speak. Observe if you can and, and, and really see is what they're saying what actually happens. I can guarantee you that it, there will be changes. Um, the, the, the sequence of events may change. Um, who they talk to may have changed. Um, it's you know it's it's kind of like that classic um, who's done it, like who who actually saw the murder scene and uh, what information can you as a witness uh, bring up. Classic. Kind of um, criminal justice um, data shows us that people don't remember these things, even things as, as important as a crime scene witnesses. They forget very uh, specific and very important details. It's just because we're not really wired to, to remember all of these. So, um, observing uh, as a, as a checks and balance method, I think is hugely important, not just talking to individuals. But because we that are brings me that, to another question that we have. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. It's the delay. Um, another listener asked a question that I think fits here, which is, how would you balance the need of knowledge about customers' mindsets and their behaviors? Yeah, so um, we actually correlate the two of them specifically. Um, so when we're, when we're doing things like um, journey mapping um, or whatever that kind of experience narrative process is, um, it, it's actually a layered effect in, in, in the sense that um, at, at, at the core, we want to know what, what their actual actions are, right? So, so uh, task flow is basically to say what is a, a person doing, um, what is the sequence of events that they're going through, who are they talking to, what are the touch points that are inter they're interacting with. From there, um, because we're doing that and observing that, but also at the same time um, 
in direct communication with consumers so that we can figure out what their behaviors are or, or their emotional states, we can, we can then correlate the two. In a lot of ways, a journey map is just a really fancy way of correlating different aspects of an experience, right? So at, at, at its core is the task or the actions that are taking place. Secondary to that could be um, the behaviors um, that are associated, and in, in, in then tertiary to that could then be the emotional states that are being um, uh, uh, either created or reflecting the, what is happening at any one time. When you do all three at the same time, we, for any moment in time of a, of a product interaction or of a service, you can then say, ah, when this happens, uh, it, it basically spurred these actions from this consumer. Um, it, it, it triggered these behaviors, and then it also um, triggered these uh, emotions. Uh, and, and, and if you don't have all three points of that information, you don't really have a very robust journey map because you can't then evaluate an experience um, not based maybe not just on the failure of a, of a product, but on, on a failure of an intended um, emotional state, whether it was to be you know happy or reduce stress or whatever that could be. So. Um, we, we are always trying to correlate and capture the, all three of those at the same time. When we do that and when we, we are capturing the, the more kind of qualitative state and um, the, the nuances of, of, of behavior and, and that level of feedback, um, a great thing that, that we have been using a lot of here at MadPow is to then say, um, if we are creating a persona or some sort of representation of an individual to, um, to, to almost provide that internal monologue um, or, or their thought process as part of what we're expressing. So um, in, in this case, in this, in this kind of uh, redacted example I have here, um, direct quotes or, or even some sort of way of, of, of creating a virtual uh, inner monologue of what this person is thinking or, or, or seeing or feeling is, is a great way to reinforce the actions that they're going through or the, the need states they may have or the end goals that they may have. So that um, if, if, if all we have is, is a representation of an individual, that that's one thing. But if we can actually point to a direct quote that we heard in the field and said, they aren't just doing this, but they're actually thinking this and feeling this, and this is what they said to reinforce that, that is a very good way of validating a persona very quickly and really getting a lot of buy-in to say that this isn't just a, a best guess of an individual or a group of people. Um, there, is, there is direct references to the type of emotional states that are being uh, uh, created as, as part of that. Uh, another very common question that, that I get all the time is, uh, if, if I am going down the line or, or the investment of creating personas, um, how many is the right number? as if there was, was some sort of kind of magical number that, that represents your entire customer base or um, a certain situation. This is actually a kind of a tricky uh, problem or a tricky answer because um, in reality, personas shouldn't be generalized for just an entire company. They should be customized for the design situation or the scenario that they, uh, they, are, they are being used for. So with that in mind, um, here at MadPod, we don't really start with personas. It's not the, the, the beginning of a project. It is um, in reaction to the understanding of the underlying um, business or system operations um, or, or service that, that, that uh, we are to design new or to evaluate uh, moving forward. So by that I mean um, we can look at the, the experience that is in place and say, well, what are all the major players of this experience? or uh, what are the major factors that would change this experience? In other words, what different behaviors or, or end outcomes would drastically change how you go to the dentist? Um, and, and then from there, because we know that there are these vari variables, then we can search to see, do, do those variables actually exist within the population? And if they do, that will then say, ah, if, if we now know the variables that would have drastic impact on how we design this experience, and we know that those variables, those different behaviors exist within the, the, the population of this company. So those are the ones that we should now model as separate personas uh, moving forward. So we can advocate for these different behaviors going forward. Um, so what, what, what you see in the screen and what we do is we'll, we'll kind of create a, uh, a persona ecosystem to say, uh, what are those different variables? And then to prioritize, sometimes the, the nuances of, um, of one persona towards another are don't actually have any major impact to the end solution that we designed to, well then let's not make a separate persona for that. Let's, let's make this as simple of a project as possible um, in, in the sense that we don't kind of overcomplicate the, 
the evaluation and design process by introducing 20 personas when in reality there's only five or six major behavioral variables that we should be modeling. Um, in this case, what, what you see on the screen, uh, this is for an insurance company uh, looking to rebuild their uh, internal customer service support system. And we didn't know at the time who should we advocate in terms of staff that have huge impacts for uh, customer service. So we, we just modeled the entire um, staff system, uh, who actually interacts with customers, who in, interacts with members, with employers, uh, which one, which of these individuals actually have a, a, a major effect or cascading effect on the experiences of customers. And then ah, from this kind of uh, persona ecosystem, we could, we could say there's actually three or four people who are hugely important. Those are the people that we need to either retrain or design around. Let's make personas for those three or four. And that's a way of, of reducing um, the, the research and, and kind of persona load, so to speak, so that we're really only hitting the individuals that are important. Um, and then, so, so finally on this idea of, of persona builds is, uh, is this notion of when not to use personas. Um, for all the reasons that I mentioned, personas are actually a really powerful and, and great tool uh, for, for advocating for individuals, uh, for influencing design in, in the decision-making process. But as, as you probably have seen, there's a lot of nuances to them, capturing um, behavior, making sure that the context that they're in is correct for the situation that they're in, making sure that they're actually clear enough to be communicated to people who maybe weren't originally familiar with the creation of the personas, making sure that there is no mistranslation of the data that's in there. Um, there's a lot of reward and there's a lot of risk involved uh, with, with persona development. And um, I think there's, there's certain situations where if the number of variables that would directly affect the outcome of a design or of an experience or, or whatever type of solution you're, you're looking for is few, where in, in this example, if the, if the only major uh, variable is individuals that use smartphones and individuals who don't use smartphones. Um, and, and if that's the only major thing that would affect your product, then you probably don't need to go ahead and make five or six or, or however many different uh, personas to represent that. Or even a persona itself, there's a lot of extra data there when instead you could, you could basically uh, build an archetype, which is just a, a simple uh, single representation of one behavior and say, we have archetypes of people who love smartphones and archetypes of people who don't. Let's design for those two, those two groups. That reduces the risk of misinterpretation over all the extra effort that goes into making a persona. And of course, this is not always the case. There's usually many, many variables in place when it comes to uh, the, what, what would affect outcomes of a, of a product or a solution, which then warrants personas. But when it is that simple, um, an, arch, an archetype modeling method or um, a jobs to be done method um, work well uh, to mitigate some of those risks. And then lastly, um, this, this starts to go into now the use of personas, not so much the creation of, but um, one of the biggest traps that I see all the time is, is, is this idea of, de of embedding the design scenario within the persona itself. And that is to say that you, t you could take a persona and um, um, whatever the, 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 the design challenge is, if it's like um, um, medication adherence for people with with chronic or uh, chronic diseases, for instance, if that's if that's the the situation that we're designing towards, and, and we have um, uh, a multiple number of different personas, and, and those different personas represent different behaviors and different uh, potential outcomes, but we just choose one, and say in this case, hey, uh, persona Mike, you are now uh, the persona that's going to be dealing with uh, this whole thing with medication and refill management. Well, that's actually negated the entire reason why we build personas to begin with. Because if we assign um, the, the scenario to design to for just one of many personas, then if, if, if others are doing their jobs correctly, they will design towards that persona's needs. Now, as an example shown here, if, if Mike is somebody who loves using smartphones, he's always on his phone, he uses it um, both for communication and for uh, getting information for doing things like prescription renewal, that's fine. And all the solutions that come out of that would then be based off of someone who loves using digital devices. And we could get uh, apps or we could get, get, get uh, responsive websites or all sorts of other solutions could uh, explode out of the fact that we've used this one persona and advocated for that person. Problem is that um, 
most customer groups aren't just of one individual. So what we've done in this case is ignore, say, uh, Frank, who also has to um, refill prescriptions, but uh, is because maybe he's older, is in many ways mortally terrified of advanced technology, does not have a smartphone, um, is rather apprehensive towards uh, those type of interfaces, much pre rather prefers to make a phone call. Well, we did. We basically uh, assigned the design challenge to, to Mike. And because we did that, we've ignored all of those other customers who really should be advocated for in designing towards solutions that aren't so um, uh, technology savvy and require smartphones and, and interface design and things of that nature. I see this all the time where, for whatever reason, uh, companies have, have assigned a persona and then assigned the actual design task to that persona. And by doing so, you are really brutally handicapping the whole reason why the personas exist, which is to not just to design towards one individual like you see here, but specifically to design towards the entire gamut and to say, okay, if we have five or six different individuals that have different behaviors and different needs and maybe, as an example, have different levels of, of uh, comfort with technology, let's go ahead and create an experience. And then from that experience, we can start to say, does that experience uh, resonate for people who are both uh, technolog uh, te technologically savvy and those who aren't? And by doing that, and by basically filtering uh, a, a potential solution through multiple different personas, that can ensure that, that the end solution works not just for one person or one group, but for the entire customer population. And that's a rather powerful asterisk as to why personas exist. Not just to develop empathy and understanding for people and design in their perspective, but to do so for the entire population, for all the different variations of behaviors that exist. Uh, another methodology uh, for doing so is the fact that we have to evaluate and prioritize whatever design or solution we come up with. Um, we could leverage a few different ways of doing that. Um, Matt Power, we're actually working on one where we're using uh, a balanced scorecard methods. This is borrowed from um, a business strategy and, and business operation methodology. Um, in, in, in doing so, infusing the, the, or the advocation of the persona, so the behavioral and emotional needs, the customer perspective could be introduced as part of the, the balanced scorecard, so to speak, so that when we are evaluating uh, a design or a solution, um, we, could, we could be doing so from the, the perspective of both the customer uh, and of the business itself. So is it working for process? Is it, is it uh, financially viable? And from a customer point of view, is it is it hitting on the right behaviors and the right emotional states? Um, this is a way of, of advocating and using personas in that sense, not just one, but the entire population of personas to, to make sure that as we evaluate an idea or as we map, in this case, what you see on your screen, map potential solutions, um, is it actually um, successful in, in achieving all the different aspects that are, that are key or important? So if we did that, in terms of, of adjusting both, A, how we develop and build personas so that they, um, they, they work for designers, they work for this key decision makers, um, and then use them correctly in the sense that they, they advocate for a design, not individually, but uh, the entire group of personas advocate for design. The end results in terms of either ideal journey maps or narratives or even just the end product itself uh, would then much further guarantee that uh, um, the solution does resonate with your customer base because personas in the end is basically just a conglomeration of who your customers really are. And that's the reason why we, we build them to begin with and I think is, is why they're still hugely uh, successful and, and rather important. So I end this by saying um, if, you, if you build them, thank you for having personas. Uh, if you're thinking about it but heard of negative things, think of this talk and um, give um, journey mapping in Persona is a second chance before you give up on, on this methodology. Um, it really is hugely uh, successful uh, and, and rather uh, powerful tool to both advocate for and design towards innovative new solutions. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. Do you have time for, well, I think we have time for a couple other questions. Sure. If you can hear me. Um, how would you move forward with design when you are creating one product or service? but your research shows several contradictory behavioral variables. This was from one of our listeners. So, um, several, could you, could you, sorry, could you just repeat that one more time? How would you move forward with design when you are creating one product or service, 
but your research shows several contradictory behavioral variables. Yeah, so this is uh, this is actually a great question and something that came up um, with a client of mine uh, about six months ago where um, the research and the um, the behavioral modeling and, and basically the development of the customer understanding uh, with, with persona development showed that um, the end or, or core values um, again, this is kind of referencing that jobs to be done, high value proposition um, perspective, um, showed that there was actually more than one kind of core of a high, um, high value proposition element that is needed. In that, in, in, in that case, we're, it was a one solution model, but there was actually two very distinct different um, um, outcomes that was, that was required. The really hard conversation to have is to say, look guys, the the, the research, the, the perspective here is showing that the end solution is actually not a single solution. It's actually a, um, either multiple different products or, or multiple different um, systems. And if anything, what, what that's doing is saying, it, it's done you a favor to say that um, this project or, or this whatever it is that, that they're building is going to be hugely successful for one population but will fail mis miserably for another or potentially could. Um, so if anything, it's, it's a predictive model to say, Mm, this may be not a, a, a one solution or one size fits all solution, and in reality, uh, should be split into, into multiple different sub products because of that. Because the perceived value and the perceived need um, is completely different based on, on, on behavioral differences. And that, and that happens often where um, a digital experience or, or something of that nature, um, in reality, becomes more than one. It, it, it's not one website, it's two. It's not one app that does. Uh, many things well, it becomes multiple apps to do a few things well, knowing that um, the, the end state, the behaviors that result in um, um, specific solutions would really make more sense as more than one product. Great, thank you. Uh, and one more question. Often after creating qualitative pers uh, personas, clients will ask how many of each type are there? How do you usually deal with questions like that. So um, how many different qualitative personas um, are there? So um, I th my response to that question would be, well, it, it depends on what they're going to be used for, right? So um, you shouldn't use the existence of, of the personas themselves uh, to validate um, the number of or, or if you're out there searching for every single variable of, of a behavior and say, oh, that person does this, it does X instead of Y, that's another persona, um, that gets you down this, this path of, of kind of infinite number of, 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 um, of personas when in reality, um, I think that the, the system that you're designing to or the product or, 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 or experience or service should actually be what dictates the number of personas uh, itself. So if you get that question of well, how many are there, uh, I think the response should be, well, however many is needed for the different variables that will directly impact this product or this service or this solution. Um, I think that is what um, I think. I think the product should um, should be guiding you on that. Now, how you do that or how you explore that, um, uh, we, we'll kind of we, we will actually map an experience um, or or sometimes even a service blueprint, which is to say um, there are multiple different methodologies to accomplish any one task. And then ask ourselves: Is there a behavior that will trigger uh, one path versus the other? In other words, if I if I buy coffee and I walk up to a counter versus going to the drive-through, that's that's two different paths to do the exact same thing. And service blueprinting uh, will map all of those. And so by doing that, you could you could potentially see uh, uh, here here are all the experience variables. Now, can we actually associate uh, some sort of behavioral trigger to, towards all these different potential possibilities? Um, and then by doing that, you'll know which, which behavior triggers are, are most important or, uh, or behavioral context that's most important. And then those should then say, here are the right personas to develop, as opposed to just saying, well, we found another random variation from one persona to, to the other, um, so let's go ahead and build another one. That's, that's a slippery slope to go down. Well, Jonathan, you've done such a great job presenting Personas, what they are, how, to, how they work. There are other questions. I'm sorry, we just don't have time to get to them all. But I really appreciate um, you joining us today and, and sharing all that you know about this. It's, it's really fascinating. 
Well, yeah, thank you very much. And, and to those who I haven't had a chance to answer questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, check out my email address on madpow.com. Um, I, I, this is a, a passionate topic, not just for myself, but for many people here at MadPow. So, um, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out, and we would love to have continue uh, discussions after the fact. And uh, thanks for the opportunity, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners for joining us and for participating with interesting questions. Um, this webcast is brought to you by the Design Management Institute, and it's a small part of the rich offerings we provide to members and the extended community. For a list of upcoming webcasts and for archives of recent conversations, you can please go to dmi.org web conversations, and please don't forget to look for information about our 40th anniversary, our upcoming conference, and our new student essay competition. Thank you so much.